Um, with that, um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Amy Romero. Thank you, Phil. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you all for joining today. We have two exciting presentations for you today. I hope that you find this webinar very informative. I just have a few announcements. SAMHSA funded 13 new family treatment drug courts that will start on September 30th. Uh, we will continue to have these peer-to-peer -peer webinars to assist you and the new programs that will come on board. On the slide, uh, you can see the states that were funded. We will have one grantee in Guam, so, uh, and we have two in Florida, two in Georgia, and then you can see on the slide the other states that will be funded. I wanted to remind you that your evaluation report for this year is due on October 31st, 2018. Please let your GPO know if you have any questions. Family drug courts funded in 2015, those of you that are on year three, should be submitting a no-cost extension request by July 30th, 2018. Please let your GPO know if you are not planning on submitting a no-cost extension, and we will send you guidance on how to do the grant closeout. You need to submit um, some documents to close out the grant. We will be having a training in Dallas, Texas on August 7th to 8th, titled Supporting Families for Re Reunification and Recovery, and the training will be conducted by CCFF. Next slide, please. Please log in to the SPAR system regularly, look at your intake and follow-up data, let your GPO know if you find any discrepancies. If you have any questions regarding your data, please call the SPARS help desk, and the contact for the SPARS help desk is on your screen. They can explain how data is calculated and guide you through some of the reports available through SPARS. Uh, make sure your evaluators have access to the SPARS system. The project director will need to grant them access. And use that data for your evaluation reports. There is a lot of data and a lot of reports that you can uh, take out uh, for your evaluations. Next slide, please. Well, I just wanted to give you an update on our GIPRA rates as a cohort. So our cohort intake is great. We are at 105%. Many of you have passed your target. Congratulations on that. Uh, the follow-up rate is still a little low. We are at 69%. Uh, please make sure that you're conducting a six-month follow-up interview for every client. For every intake, we must have a follow-up interview. Our client target as a cohort is 2,018 parents, and we have served 1,492 parents. So that's great. Um, and that number is starting since September 2015. So since September 2015, our family treatment drug court cohort has served 1,492 parents. Uh, and that is according to GIPRA. So these are parents that have GIPRA intakes. Some of you may have served additional parents but have no GIPRA intakes. So those are not counted. Okay, and that's all I have. So I'll pass it back to, to Phil. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate that, and um, I appreciate all the hard work of, of the SAMHSA grantees and serving so many uh, families. Um, again, I just want to make one more announcement. Um, if you are not speaking, if you could mute your own line, that would be really helpful. We are picking up some background noise from a few folks, um, and we want to make sure that, um, that we don't interrupt our speakers. So again, uh, welcome today uh, to your peer-to-peer -peer webinar, Innovative Strategies to Meet Children's Needs and Support Family Engagement and Family Treatment Drug Courts. Um, I'm going to move now to um, our friends from Washington, our Clark County, Washington Family Treatment Court. I'd like to introduce uh, Shauna McCloskey, Helen Sullivan, and Dr. Holly Crossan. And I'll turn it over first to Shauna. Hi, thanks, Bill. Um, hello, everyone. We're um, always excited to share some of the innovative strategies that we're using to really address um, service needs of children, but also just from a whole family-centered care. And so part of our presentation, I have Dr. Holly Crossan on the line who per conducts and actually performs 
our neuropsychological evaluation that we'll be talking about today, as well as uh, Helen Sullivan, the clinical supervisor that is our direct liaison from Children's Center to our family treatment drug court team. So I will first pass it over to Holly. Hi. I also really enjoy talking about the different work that I get to do with families. Um, it started really with working with children um, who have brain differences and wanting to figure out how to best help them at home and in their school environment and actually in treatment. And so when we were given an opportunity for the grant, we were discussing different ways we could help, and a lot of the parents we had worked with had um, a lot of brain differences also. And so one of the ways that we had decided we could help them is just like with the children, kind of in schools, the children have individualized education plans, IEPs, was to kind of work on this IEP idea with parents to help them in treatment. Um, instead of individualized education plans, it's kind of individualized uh, treatment plans. But as part of the process, uh, a lot of the parents that we work with have difficulties with their brain functioning after extended drug use, plus some of them also have had prenatal exposure or other abuse. So we started using an abbreviated neuropsychological evaluation to look at the executive functioning of parents and children. Um, that had been affected by substance use exposure. Next slide. So when looking at executive functioning, one of the things is trying to make some comparisons so people can understand. So overall IQ, which a lot of people are familiar with, is general intelligence, and that can be compared to the basic engine of a car. And this kind of determines the overall horsepower or the ability of the engine. So we have our basic IQ that we get to use, and most of the individuals we work with end up being in the average range, which is considered kind of the 25th to 75th percentile. Some of them are low average, or if they had um, some difficulties as children, then they would be in the lower range. But then when looking at executive functioning, this is what is considered in the frontal lobe, and that's what's most affected by uh, drug use which can be with the children or with prenatal exposure or parents who've been using for a while. Um, and that is the processes that kind of help us regulate, control, and manage our thoughts and actions. And so as part of my car analogy, frequently to explain this better, I um, give examples of how each of those can be impacted by the uh, – my screen keeps flashing, I'm sorry. Um, so, brakes, the brakes of the car can be compared to inhibition, so there's a lot of different executive functions that are important for people to use, and so looking at things that get, in, get the participants into trouble where they're looking at not being able to function as well is looking at the brakes of the car, which is the inhibition, the gear shifter, which is the ability to kind of shift between one thing to the next. Um, also, the gas pedal is kind of the processing speed, starter is initiation, the turn signal is being able to actually communicate things. And so if you are struggling with your inhibition and your brakes of your car aren't working, then your car is still going to crash even if you're in the average range for your intelligence. And so it's important to figure out what things are getting in the way of helping individuals to be able to use the intelligence they have. And a lot of times these things can kind of look like willful um, noncompliance instead of an executive functioning issue. Over time, many people begin to kind of cover for their disabilities that they're having and the struggles that they're having. And so they have a lot of things that they try to make themselves look normal. And so then it looks even more like they're just not complying with what people are asking them to do. And that can kind of get them into trouble. Um, so if someone has an average IQ, such as like the 50th percentile is very average, but only 9 percentile executive functioning, their ability to kind of complete their day-to-day -day tasks or things that are required of the court, 
um, is often closer to that nine percentile. And so that means they're functioning um, at a level where 91% of people their age are doing better than they are at um, managing their day-to-day -day tasks and getting things done. And so drug use doesn't impact IQ as much as executive functioning. There are certain aspects of it, such as working memory or processing speed, but um, executive functioning is impaired in most of the people that we have uh, worked with in family treatment court. And so approximately 95% of the parents we see have had deficits that are at the 16th percentile or less in one or more areas of executive functioning. Um, usually, I'd say at least two areas, and it potentially impacts their ability to be successful. Next slide, please. So, some of another way of trying to look at it, which I explained already, is that there's executive functions, and there's a whole bunch of them. Sometimes they're grouped in as few as eight or as many as 16 to 24, depending on kind of what you're looking at. And then I have the car analogy, but I think it's important to kind of look at the misinterpretation also of how um, people can view people who have these executive functioning impairments. And then on this chart is also kind of like real world examples of where they might struggle with that. So for example, in the first one, task initiation is kind of like the spark plug to the engine. If the spark plug's not firing, they can't get going. And in order to have initiation on tasks that they're asked to do, their spark plug kind of has to work in their executive functioning. So if they have this issue with initiation, it can frequently be misinterpreted as being lazy, apathetic, like they don't, just don't care. Um, and in a real world example, they display procrastination, they put off minor household tasks or doing things that they've been asked to do, um, including by um, their CPS kind of caseworkers or their uh, treatment providers or the court itself. And so if they don't have some of the accommodations in order to help them be more successful, then they can't uh, do as well with that. So other things is kind of like planning is like the GPS system, again, kind of like they don't care or they're goalless. Um, they struggle with being able to explain priorities and goals, losing out on opportunities, such as even going to a favorite restaurant because they don't make reservations or plan ahead. So a lot of times with the executive functioning issues, you end up seeing that they are also having those difficulties in their day-to-day -day life of things that they like to do, not just in the court experience. But I think with a lot of the parents that we use, things like the response inhibition, their ability to stop themselves, the breaks. Um, they can sometimes look aggressive, careless, insensitive, um, and that plays into a lot of relapses and difficulties with drinking, gambling, doing things without considering the impact on other people. And so it's really important when we're doing this testing to kind of identify which of these executive functionings are they having difficulty with, and then to try to provide some accommodations for those things. Um, next slide, please. So some of the examples of some of the accommodations that we end up giving to them is to be able to look at what ways can we support them. So if they don't seem to understand what you're asking, which can sometimes happen with some of these executive functions, um, such as if they're struggling with uh, things like working memory or sustained attention, um, they have a lot of trouble with keeping things organized or paying attention and knowing kind of what it is they need to do is to kind of then you make sure you simplify um, or condense instructions or make them more concrete or make sure that you write them down for them. So another thing that can be done in some of the accommodations that we work on is break the task or assignments into smaller chunks to meet their developmental or skill level so they can accomplish it. Um, if they're having trouble with that initiation piece that we were talking about, try providing a cue or some kind of structure, such as a checklist. So also for things like working memory issues when they're starting to miss appointments and things, sometimes teaching them to use their alarms and their phones or other things like that to remind them to call the UA, the color line. Um, 
or if they don't know what to do or if they know what to do but not how to do it, kind of give a prompt such as, first, you need to do this, um, sometimes trying to see if there can be mentors or other supports in place to kind of help them. Um, considering the environment when you're working with them, just like with kids, if there's attentional issues, uh, making sure like kids in a classroom, you make sure that they are sitting in an area where they can pay the best attention, that there's not a lot of things going on around them. The same can be true when you're meeting with them one-on-one -on -one or trying to give them information or if they're in a group, making sure that they have the same kind of accommodations where you make sure that there's not a lot of distractions, you're not sitting them in the busiest area or you're putting them closer to being able to understand um, a lot of them that we seem to work with um, in doing the testing have some trouble with what's called verbal shifting and so making sure that if they're struggling in that area, that means they have trouble with people changing topics a lot. Their brain can't shift from one to another, another very well. So then to make sure you don't jump around with various topics, like complete one when you're talking to them and then provide a transition to the next topic. So for example, um, we were talking to you about your visit. Now I'm going to ask you questions about your treatment or you can even ask them, you know, was there anything else you want to talk about or are we done with that topic and then kind of move on to the next. I think a caseworker when we were just having some feedback gave a great example of that, of her bringing the person back to, okay, you wanted to make sure we've talked about this. Is this done? Okay, not yet. Okay, let's finish this and then we'll go to this. So trying to really help them with that transitioning between topics and making sure they know kind of what they should do. So really it's just getting a fingerprint of their brain and kind of seeing where their strengths and weaknesses are and then talking to the team about how to use those strengths and the weaknesses and then discussing some accommodations that can be done to help them be the most successful that they can be while they're participating in family treatment court and hopefully giving them some skills to continue on with. So that's kind of my part of what I get to do is get to know their brain and pass on the information to the team. And Helen, I think that leaves you, you get to go next. Okay. So, so I'm going to pass this to Helen Sullivan. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So given the importance of the information that Holly gets with the assessments, it's extremely important that we make sure that it gets to everyone that it needs to so that the information can be utilized throughout the course of the individual's participation, as she mentioned, not just through the family treatment court, but hopefully ongoing. Um, so I'll speak to what our, how we manage to get the feedback out to everyone. Wherever possible, an effort is made to share the results with a participant first. This is not always possible because some participants are hesitant to schedule their feedback sessions because they're worried about what the results might be. But we make every effort to ensure that their participation is early in the process, and that includes really spending some time orienting the participant to the neuropsych prior to the testing to kind of talk about what their fears are, what it may or may not be, what their experiences have been perhaps with other types of evaluations, and kind of give them correct information on what it is that we're really looking for and how it can be of use to them. Ultimately, it's very empowering for clients when they understand their own learning styles and can receive information about their individual strengths, not just the areas that they might need accommodation in. And having that information allows them to advocate for themselves, not just in court, but in all situations, particularly in settings where others may not recognize their needs. Uh, the recommended rec accommodations are presented in very specific terms, and it's hoped that with practice, coaching, and support, the participants will learn the skills that can be generalized to all areas of their lives, will increase their parenting skills, and further their goal for family reunification. The clients are encouraged to feel free to bring others to their feedback sessions if they wish, a family friend, um, a family member, a social worker, they're all welcome to come and hear the results with the client's permission. Um, it can be very helpful having someone else hear their results because not only can they be a support to the participant, but they can reinforce the material later. Additional follow-up sessions, we call them coaching sessions, are also available to participants if they'd like to, a little bit more help in developing a particular accommodation to help them in a situation that they're really having some challenges with. We also provide feedback sessions to the team and on occasion to smaller subsets of the team that might want additional consultation to assist in interacting with the participant more effectively. 
In the initial team feedback session, the results of the testing are summarized, including areas of strength and weakness, ways in which the deficits might be manifest in real life, and specific recommendations that can prove helpful, both in terms of suggesting useful actions by the team, as well as highlighting important skills to be fostered in the participant. We've noticed that feedback to the team has been especially effective in correcting potentially negative perceptions of the participant. Frequently, this feedback introduces the option of can't to replace the negative perception of won't that Holly just spoke about in assessing the participant's behavior. What may initially have been seen as defiance or noncompliance can be regarded as something that the client is unable to do, not unwilling to do. Similarly, what may have been regarded as lack of motivation or worse laziness might actually be the client's difficulty with initiation and indicates the need for help with cues or other prompts to take action on a required or recommended course. When presented with testing results, we notice that team members frequently report a greater understanding of reasons for specific behaviors, patterns of behavior, or other challenges that they'd already observed. There's an opportunity for additional discussion of ways in which the team can be more supportive. This can range from simple rephrasing of a request to the use of close-ended questions to readjusting the order of requirements or the number of tasks assigned. Understanding of the individual's functioning helps to inform more appropriate responses in court, with the team choosing responses that better align with the participant's needs and will support their growth in specific areas. The results of the testing can also be used by involved treatment providers, parent educators, and others to better inform their interventions. Understanding of the individual's learning styles allows providers to tailor the manner in which they offer important information in a format most likely to be understood. Providers also become more sensitive to cues that indicate that a participant may be having difficulty comprehending important information or may be overwhelmed, giving them an opportunity to intervene in an appropriate manner. We find that education of the entire team has proven to be a huge benefit. It's been useful not only in terms of allowing each member a chance to adjust his or her expectation of the participant and the manner of interaction, but it encourages team members to keep the relevance of the assessment in mind during court each week. Next slide, please. Thanks, Helen. So this is Shauna. I'm the program coordinator for our family treatment court. And, um, you know, the value of family treatment courts is having so many disciplines around the table because each of us has our own lens and perspective. Having this additional testing, really, I can't emphasize enough, is so powerful in understanding kind of the current snapshot of the brains functioning for our uh, parents and even some of the uh, children that get tested over time. And so in our program, we contracted with NPC research firm. Uh, we're fortunate that they live in Portland. We're right across the river. And so with that nationally uh, recognized firm, they walked us through a full process, outcome and cost savings evaluation of our program. And what we found, we got a lot of our questions answered that a lot of our stakeholders wanted to know. Uh, the first is always, you know, does family treatment courts increase re reunification rates? And overall, the answer is absolutely yes. Family drug court uh, participants involving the services were nearly 30% more likely to be reunified with their children. Important to note, we even had the opportunity to compare when we added this neuropsychological evaluation in addition to some other parent education pieces to our program prior to these enhanced services and found um, that there was even a higher reunification, case, uh, reunification rate since prior to the implementation of these services, 74% uh, compared to our operationals was about 61% at that point. Another question often asked, do children spend less time in out-of-home placements? And the answer, yes. However, I do want to caution to those listening around the country that sometimes reunifying, reunifying children uh, faster isn't necessarily the best question to ask. It's ensuring 
that it's done in a safe and timely manner in which we do, do not like to have reentry into the child welfare system. And what we found with our evaluation results that children were less likely to reenter the system. Um, we also, parents were more likely to complete substance use disorder treatment. They spent longer in treatment just with the engagement of all the, the team and the structure, the, the support that they receive in our program, and twice as likely to complete. We had a cost savings, you can read on the screen, of a little over $10,000 for family treatment court parents over the course of two years. Um, the initial cost, also the first year because there's such an upfront cost of team members around the table, but over two years is, is that cost point for us. And additionally, with all the skills and services, they were parents were less likely to reoffend in the criminal justice system. So it's critical, in my opinion, to contract with someone to help capture the process evaluation, the outcome, so you're able to give those figures to your stakeholders to talk to your community, and that really follows into the sustainability plan. Here in Clark County, Washington, we are very fortunate to have a localized one-tenth of one percent behavioral health sales tax. So portions of the sales tax does support and fund this assessment process for parents involved in family treatment court. We've expanded that to some of our other treatment courts. But I would also suggest use some of the program cost savings from the evaluation to continue to seek support. I know uh, children and family futures, they constantly talk about the need for oversight committees and steering committees. Um, that's an excellent avenue to ensure that they have this information, the cost savings, the reunification, and just overall, it helps with the child welfare system. Next slide. I'll keep talking in the interest of time. So lessons learned that we found in our process of implementing some of the enhanced services that um, I already spoke to uh, conduct an evaluation early into the case. Not only can they help coach you what to track, but how frequently as the outcomes can be powerful. I would say lessons learned of starting this neuro neurological uh, evaluation, neuropsych that we call it, um, to en ensure that parents and the team understand the value and it's not to hinder a case. Uh, some of the fear. Some of the fear is if they don't understand why we're using this, um, we don't want to prevent and slow a case down. It's really an opportunity to help us understand their learning style and how to make accommodations for them. Uh, of course, it helps individualize their case plan in responding to the clients. And another lesson learned, just to ensure that if referrals and recommendations are made, to constantly follow up to ensure that the accommodations and those referrals are being made. On the, on the screen, you'll see a snapshot of we use the North Carolina Family Assessment Scale at pre and post service entry, and you can see clearly they improved in, I believe, all areas but self-sufficiency, uh, still getting parents to be able to um, employability and manage all of that at the end is still, still a struggle for us, but overall, extremely powerful, beneficial, and really helped in our program. Thank you. All right, thank you. Excellent. Um, and we're going to have time to circle back for questions. So again, we thank you, Shonda, Helen, and Holly, for your for your uh, presentation of your program. And the outcomes are very impressive. Um, I'd like to now shift over to Travis County. Yeah. So while we wait, Rachel, maybe we can uh, uh, see if there are some questions that folks might have for Clark County. Okay. Um, we know one, yeah. one question we did receive prior um, was, um, and I don't know who would like to take it, maybe Shauna, um, if you were, what advice or next step would you encourage a fellow grantee to take if they were interested in implementing um, a, you know, the psychiatric evaluations or psychological evaluations? Um, who would they reach out to? What would be a kind of a concrete next step for them to take? So this is Shauna. Um, 
program coordinator, I would really encourage uh, current teams to seek out their local community mental health providers, see if on staff, if they have clinical psychologists who can perform this test, obviously, um, and really start communicating about the value of understanding um, and not being so confused with because an individual use substances that they won't be able to progress and understanding where their brain functioning is. Um, as Holly mentioned, it's really, it helps us understand how they regulate, how they process information, and it's so critical in our end goal of reunifying families to really use any and every tool available in your community. Helen or Holly, did you have any additional um, thoughts about how to implement this around the nation and other communities? Well, this is Helen. I, I definitely would agree with con contacting um, a children's a mental health program, um, I think initially because I think there's some precedent for the services. We actually had our children's program in place a, a long time before we started working with adults. Uh, I think you know they would be able to kind of recommend, if not someone on staff, at least someone in the community that perhaps they've worked with um, that might be interested. And Holly, can you suggest some kind of maybe national groups to contact that would have ideas of in what area? I think locally, looking at just their like, are looking at. Um, just their board of psychologists and kind of finding someone who has experience probably with both children and adults. When we do our training to get our degree, we learn in both areas that people kind of specialize in each. But the tool that I use, um, the DCAF, the Dallas Kaplan Executive Function System, is um, a tool that is used from eight to 89 year olds. So it really spans the long grouping, so as long as they've had training and doing something like that, um, then that gives us, that would give them the ability to work with them on um, helping to examine the families that they are looking at serving. I, I wouldn't want to be discouraging, but I, I do think that finding funding to support that process is important also. And looking, and I think that's where Sean is talking about um, really getting buy-in on the importance of it so that you ha can reach out to stakeholders that will invest in this process. I think it's obviously very worth investing in, but it is, it is difficult to fund because insurances do not fund for this type of assessment under these conditions. I mean, they're looking at Medicaid, medically necessary only, and with the exception of very recent TBI's um, insurances declined to support that. So the, uh, at least at, in, this, in the world that we're in right now, I think you need to be looking for other sources of funding. Yeah, thanks. We found in, in some communities they've been able to partner with a physician who would be willing to sign off on, um, on the medical necessity in order to get these assessments completed. So that's another opportunity to maybe p partner with your um, medical provider um, in your communities. Um, one last question, and I think we're going to try and see if uh, Michelle's back. But as you guys were beginning to implement this, if you can go back probably more than eight years ago now, um, when you first started this, did you get any pushback from um, any of your partners, particularly your um, defense counsel, and how this information might be used, and how did you work through some of those things? And Helen, I'll, I'll have you answer that because you were there at the start. I joined later. Yes, I, yes, I think there definitely was some pushback on there because there is concern that, you know, frequently um, psychologicals are used in terms of assessing parents looking at long-term projection of their parenting abilities and making some decisions around permanence. And I think there was some worry, especially when we were doing assessments on people who are still in the early stages of recovery, if at all, at that point, um, whether or not the, the results are going to be essentially damning in terms of their ability to parent their children. However, Holly has been extremely clear, and I think that we, it's now been borne out and people trust, that the results of this of the testing are, is a snapshot. It's this moment in time. It's for use in working with a client at this particular time and cannot be used to project in terms of their ultimate functioning. 
and I think, I, I mean, over the time, I, I think that people have come to understand and trust that that's true. Well, and I'd like to add that in doing this, because I'm licensed in two states and I do um, CPS kind of evalu DHS evaluations of parents in Oregon for the purpose of parenting, that I stay away from when I'm doing this testing, any of those things that might contribute to um, being used negatively against them. So we don't do any of the personality testing or di I don't do diagnosis. Um, I'm strictly looking at just the executive functioning piece, something that's considered to change over the time, like executive functioning will improve for two years in recovery. And a lot of these parents I'm seeing after frequent relapses um, and in like days after sometimes where I would never do that in the community for like a long-term parenting evaluation. So we're clear that this, these should not contribute to whether or not visits change or um, a parent gets a child back. It's literally just to learn about ways we can better support them in making it through the program, but not, there's no discussion about parenting in them when they're completed or their ability to parent overall. Thank you. Hey, Rachel, let's see if Michelle was able to join back with us. Can everyone hear me now? Yes, thank you, Michelle. So, okay, and no feedback, Luke? Uh, oh, that sounds good. So, okay, uh, great. Okay, um, apologies for the technical issues. My name is Michelle Kimbrough, and I'm the Services Manager for the Parenting and Recovery Family Drug Treatment Court Program. I'm here with Stephanie Sefuentes. Uh, one of our child and family therapists. And what we're going to talk to you about today is the program that we've set up for uh, the children um, of the parents that we work with in the Family Drug Court Program. Um, we have been in serv serving families uh, since 2008. Uh, that's when we had our first hearings, and we've been gradually expanding since then. Long about um, 2011, we applied for and we were able to get a uh, child therapist hired through a grant um, from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. And the role of that therapist was to assess the children in our program. Uh, we only accept parents who have a child age zero to five. Um, so most of them have um, just one child, uh, but many of them also have older children um, who are in other placements while they go to treatment. Um, we hired the child, and, uh, child therapist in 2011, and then we were able to get an extension on our RPG grant, um, which was the first grant that we got for the program originally in 2008, and this allowed us to hire an additional child therapist um, and also to get a designated attorney ad litem for the children. So instead of all of the children in the program being appointed to different attorney ad litems through the county, um, through a, a list of private attorneys that they had that work with the county, instead we um, were able to get one that would, unless there was a conflict, work with all of the children in the program. At the present time, and since those grants um, have expired, um, we have had the county fully funding those positions. In fiscal year 2017, we served 77 children, and that was approximately 63 parents. Over half of them are under two. Um, many of the referrals that we get are parents who have delivered a baby, and either they or the baby have tested positive. All of the parents, all the mothers, enter treatment with their child, age zero to five, for 90 days of residential treatment. And the other piece of information is that CPS does not take custody of the children. Uh, we call these court-ordered services cases. So basically what that means is there is a petition filed, um, it is a child welfare lawsuit, um, but instead of the state asking for custody, they're just asking for the parents to be ordered to do services. And that means we don't have to worry about any of the deadlines, the legal deadlines, 
um, and we can actually work with the parents and the children for the 12 to 18 months uh, that it usually takes to complete our program. Um, of our graduates, and this is, you know, since the beginning, 96% uh, of them have ended up with custody of their children. Uh, other statistics that we're really proud of is that um, the child therapist, and I'm going to let Stephanie explain a little bit more about that, um, will do uh, the ASQ, the Ages and Stages Questionnaire, and the CANS um, assessment tools, and 80%, or excuse me, 89% of the children demonstrate improvement on those measures. Um, also, they improve on their parenting skills uh, through uh, documented evidence through the AAPI too. 80% uh, demonstrate improvement. And then overall, for all of the final orders in the CPS case, we have about 92% of children ending up with their parent and 8% ending up with relatives. So it's, um, and that was last, last year, fiscal year 2017. Um, sustainability of all of this has required a lot of effort. It's required a lot of training. Um, our team is very invested uh, in this process and in the welfare of the children. Um, and so is our commissioner's court. So with that, without further ado, I will uh, pass it on to Stephanie. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the services that we have set up for children. And in front of you, you'll see the components of child services. And these basically guide our team discussions, not only as they relate to children's services, but also um, the drug court process for their parents. The first one is Trust-Based Relational Intervention, TBRI for short, and TBRI is a therapeutic model that's designed for people from hard places um, who've had experienced complex developmental trauma. And so it uses the principles of connecting, empowering, and correcting, and these principles help to guide us as a team. Um, the judge is trained in TBRI, and it influences her interactions with clients from the bench. And the team and many of our community partners are also trained in TBRI. Um, our two child therapists are fully trained as practitioners and as trainers. And so um, my fellow child therapist and I have done several trainings in the community and within our team to kind of help us all get on the same page. We use TBRI in our direct work with children and their caregivers. And we also facilitate um, a parenting group twice a month before court for the parents. Uh, the second component is visitation. Um, when I first started this, uh, started in this position back in 2011, um, visitation was my soapbox, and it kind of still is. So we view visits as the right of a child, not as a reward or punishment for the parent based on how they're doing. Um, we're moving towards best practices, um, which is daily contact for infant and two to three times a week for school-aged children, but we're not quite there. So right now, we are doing a minimum of twice weekly visits. Um, we also try to enhance those visits by using uh, video contact, phone contact, and helping the parents to write love notes to their kids that the placement can read to them every day, so they're getting as much um, as close to daily contact as possible without having the actual physical contact if that's not possible. The child therapists also facilitate visits to help with that contact because, of course, with limited resources and transportation um, and people to supervise the visits, um, it can be a real challenge to even get the twice a week. So the child therapist actually helps do some of those visits. Um, Enhanced visits or therapeutically facilitated visits help to maintain the parent-child bond. Children adjust more easily to placement and they show less stress and the parents stay more hopeful and motivated. And also with the therapist's help, um, they're practicing new ways of interacting with their children rather than repeating the maladaptive patterns of family interactions. So a lot of times with visits, we see the parents go in and they just kind of perpetuate the same negative cycle of behavior that got them into services in the first place. And with increased visitation and the help of the therapist, they're able to really start to practice new skills um, and build new patterns 
and re repair that relationship that's been broken. And so the last um, component that I think is really important for our program is training. And so I put training, 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 because one thing that I am really proud of our program about is that we function really well as a team. Um, we have done cross-training between the different roles, so each person in our team, so CASA, CPS, the attorneys, the therapists, um, the ad litem, all, all of the different players and our community partners um, have taken time to, to inform the rest of the team exactly what their role is and what their perspective or lens is. And it really helps us to understand each other's point of view and to reduce conflict on those cases that are really complicated um, or those clients that are really good at splitting the team. Um, we have annual team building day that is great for building group cohesion and we make sure that everyone is trained. So the judge, um, she is adamant about attending trainings and being on top of her game when it comes to children's services. Um, we make sure that our team gets training not only in children's services but we bring in um, experts on trauma, domestic violence, and lots of other issues. And then we help to train the community partners too. And so we're working to get everyone on the same page so that they really have our ultimate goal um, in mind that the child, the best place for the child, sorry, is with a safe, healthy, sober, and nurturing parent. Next slide, please. So when you bring a new team member on, there's always going to be um, a little bit of trouble when you first get started. So I say be patient. If you're trying to integrate a child therapist into your team, be patient with the team. Um, it requires patience and education to the team and lots of cross referrals to kind of show the clients the team functions as a whole. So for example, if a client comes to me with a case management need, rather than just tackling that myself, I'll say, oh, well, you need to refer to your case manager. Or if they're bringing up legal issues, then I might say your attorney would be a great person to ask that question. Um, and likewise, the other team members, if they bring up a question about their child or they notice something going on with their child, they're going to refer them back to the child therapist. Um, so the functions, the things that the child therapists do, we assess all the children within 30 days. So we do the ages and stages questionnaire and the social emotional um, version of that and the adult adolescent parenting inventory which is um, an, an assessment of parental attitudes. Um, and we do a pre and post for all of those. We obtain a psychosocial history, we get developmental information, um, attachment and relationship information, and their exposure to trauma and parenting skills. And so with all of that, we develop treatment goals with the child and family. We do our best to support children and their parents in their natural environment to get to the root of issues and to promote lasting change. So they're really getting a chance to practice. Um, so we'll do things like ride the bus with a parent and their child to go grocery shopping and come back and see how do we actually navigate in real life um, some of the challenges that they face. That it's, it's one thing to talk about it um, and it's another thing to actually go through and do it with, with the family and help them. We promote healthy attachment and relationships with caregivers. So we look at the client not only as the individual parent and the individual child, but also as the dyad. So we want to heal the heart as well as teach the head. We support caregivers' ability to meet children's needs. And what's really important is sharing information with the team. And so like I said, we do cross referrals. Um, we report progress on goals and strengths. We utilize team members for information regarding concerns um, and goals and progress. So everyone's kind of working together at those case management meetings to figure out exactly what the needs are and who is going to be the person um, to help address those needs. Next slide, please. And so lastly, more specifically, 
and the services that the child therapist provides. Um, you can see in front of you. Some of these are um, evidence-based practices, so the trauma-focused CBT, the infant parent psychotherapy, the nurturing parenting skills training, and the EMDR, the eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Um, these are all um, evidence-based practices that you can find on the National Registry of Evidence-Based Practices through SAMHSA. Um, the child therapist, um, we strive um, to be very flexible in the services we provide. So in addition to just doing like individual therapy with the child or um, parent education or psychotherapy with the family, we try to really figure out what the needs are and to help them meet those needs. Um, we also refer out to a number of other services that the child therapist helps coordinate. So some of those are um, parent coaching. Um, we do individual therapeutic parent coaching rather than using a parenting skills group, um, using the nurturing parenting program. And all parents get this. They get 16 weeks um, of individual in-depth parent coaching in addition to um, the work with the child therapist. And you can see some of the other things that we've provided, um, lactation consultant, um, help to facilitate developmental therapy evaluation. Infant massage has been really great. We've had several successful groups while in treatment. We had a massage therapist um, that would go to uh, the recovery center where our women went with their babies and do a group with all of the moms that had young infants. So they learned infant massage. And then we do other therapies and enrichment activities. So our goal is to really comprehensively meet the needs of the children and to provide natural community-based opportunities and supports for success um, in a variety of settings. And so, thank you. <laughs> in conclusion, um, that's the gist of what we do, the components that guide our services and how we try to help meet the needs of our children. And so now we'd like to hand it back to our host um, and open for question and answer. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, really amazing, uh, the services you're providing there, Stephanie and Michelle. Um, I think we're just about out of time uh, for questions, unfortunately, but I know that our presenters would be more than happy to connect with you via phone and or email. Um, so, so feel free to reach out to us if you have questions or you'd like to connect to, to, um, to these counties, uh, to these treatment courts. Uh, we would love to connect with you. Um, <clears throat> We have a, a couple um, resources that um, that are available to all of you for free if you're interested in learning more about kind of these comprehensive uh, parent-child services. Um, one of the resources that we have available um, is called the Prevention and Family Recovery Briefs, um, in which we go through um, there are a series of five briefs looking at how family treatment courts across the country uh, shifted to really a family-centered comprehensive service kind of programs. Um, we also um, chronicled um, those experiences through um, uh, four case studies. So those are available to you. Also, um, and Clark County was one of our grantees featured, but we have the Children Affected by Methamphetamine uh, brief available to you. Um, that was a program also supported by SAMHSA in which 12 family treatment courts brought on um, children's services. And it talks about some of the challenges you heard from these grantees in terms of how to integrate um, some of these services into your programs. Um, so those are available to you. Um, we'd be happy to share those with you if you haven't seen those. Um, um, so feel free to reach out to us with your technical assistance needs. And with that, I'd like to just kick it back over to Amy for any other closing comments. Um, and the last thing I would say would be uh, thanks again to our speakers and thanks to all of you for hanging in there during some of the technical difficulties. Amy? Thank you, Field. I just want to quickly thank all of our presenters for today for the excellent presentations and for sharing all of that information. I hope that you all find that information helpful. So everyone, have a great afternoon. Great. Thank you. And I think thank that you. will conclude today's webinar. Thanks, Rachel, for hosting. Thank you all.